Before we start, please hear a message from International News Today Network. Starting today, for every subscriber, International News Today Network will plant one tree to save our planet. Please help contribute in saving our planet by subscribing to our channel. One subscriber equals one tree. Thanks. The kickback. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy in the world. Mankind is your foreign dollar claims are twenty seven point three. August 24, 1965, the Soviet government instructs the Chelome Design and Testing Facility to build manned interceptor ships. Two cosmonauts are to conduct reconnaissance from space, monitor enemy satellites, and destroy them if they present a threat. To this end, they want to equip the ship with a rapid-fire cannon. But was it even possible to fire a cannon in outer space? After all, that had never been done before. The problem here is, how do you ensure that when the cannon is fired, the space station doesn't shift from orbit? On Earth, for example, if you were to fire from a Kalashnikov assault rifle, which is what I'm about to do now, the kickback, I'm the one who will absorb it. Let's have a look. And... Oh! So, did you see the movement that the gun made when it went back, the rifle? That's the recoil that we're talking about. Now, this movement here, the shoulder going back, this is what they were trying to recreate in space. But since there's no person that can absorb that impact, they had to find a plan B. What if after taking a few shots, the spaceship is knocked out of orbit and even its thrusters can't bring it back? What is a weapon of the same caliber as the one that we're going to put on the space station capable of? I asked my colleague Alexei Smirnov to test the 23mm anti-aircraft cannon. Now he is famous for having tested many different firing systems in front of tens of millions of viewers. Alexei? Зу-23 — это, конечно, не та пушка, которую советские конструкторы собирались отправить в космос, но по всем своим боевым характеристикам она очень похожа на пушку Нудельмана Рихтера, которую планировали отправить на первые космические станции. Сегодня у меня только осколочно-зажигательные, вот с таким вот розовым носиком. Thick oak logs, fortifications built from car tires, sandbags and concrete blocks, and iron barrels filled with water. What will happen when they're hit by a shell from such a gun? Я ложу на гашетку и проверю сейчас дуб на прочность. Вы готовы? Я да. Нарубить дров при помощи разушки очень легко и быстро. Я выпустил всего лишь 40 патронов и дерево просто в щепки. Одна пуля остается, пробивает первое дерево, второе, третье получается. И в третьем дереве вот она застряла, смотрите. The metal barrels filled with water literally explode when hit. Армагеддон настоящий, огонь, клубы дыма. But look at the recoil. The cannon is mounted on a heavy truck with its six wheels planted firmly on the ground. 
but a space station would have no such support. Calculations carried out on Earth showed that firing a cannon in space would require not only ammo, but also plenty of fuel. Необходимо было парировать отдачу, поскольку отдача была довольно сильная, то для этого, чтобы отдачу парировать, включались двигатели жесткой стабилизации. In theory, the solution was to use thrusters to prevent the spaceship from being jolted out of orbit after firing its cannon. But it wouldn't be until 1975, when the third Salut spacecraft reached orbit, that scientists could determine how a space cannon would perform in zero gravity and what would happen to the station after firing it. We will talk about that a little later. First, we'll tell you about the first Salut station, aka the Almaz. No one had ever sent people to space on long missions at that time. That's why the launch of Almaz was being prepared meticulously. Now, let's take a look at the first house for Soviet cosmonauts. Come with me. The Almaz looked like two huge barrels, one larger and one smaller, hooked together. The small barrel contained a three-person crew compartment, while the larger one served as a working area. Here the Almaz is to be used to monitor American intercontinental missiles and spacecraft launches. Moscow has just received information that the U.S. is working on a space cruiser that could pose great danger to Soviet satellites. The space cruiser was to be shaped like a long arrowhead and launched into orbit by a nuclear-powered submarine with the help of a Minuteman intercontinental missile. Its mission was to monitor enemy satellites and destroy them if necessary. It was a two-person vehicle. You could put two astronauts in it, and they were military people. What were they going to do? Well, part of the agenda was they could undertake reconnaissance. It would be a next-generation spy plane. And so it's sort of not, not necessary in that context. Could you drop atomic bombs on the Soviet Union from a space-based plane? But above all, the space cruiser had to counter the Soviet spy satellites that had been constantly hanging over U.S. fleets in low orbit since the early 70s. To destroy them, they decided to arm the space interceptors with cannons, but it never came to that. In 1976, the U.S. Navy curtailed the space cruiser program. Every rocket program, every space plane program, every reconnaissance uh, vehicle, every one of them had budget pro uh, problems. There is an old saying in engineering that uh, you have three interactive problems to solve. One is cost, one is reliability, and one is schedule. And and the answer is you have to pick two. You cannot have all three. But financial problems aside, the space programs of the USSR and USA were slowing down in the mid-70s due to the emergence of detente. Moscow, May 1972. The superpowers signed a treaty limiting missile defense systems, which specifically banned space-based missile defense systems. Pictures from the signing ceremony replete with smiling faces travel around the world. The testing of fighter satellites is temporarily halted. Formula 74 был испытан спутник A с смешениями. Испытания тоже показали хорошие результаты, но в это время как раз стал вопрос о мирном исследовании космоса, и поэтому эти работы пришлось несколько приостановить. Поэтому пять лет эти испытания прекратились. At the same time, work on orbital stations, the eyes of both countries' military, never stopped for a minute. In May of 1973, in the midst of the Soviet-American rapprochement, America's Skylab station was launched into orbit. This was, in fact, a re-equipped upper stage of the huge Saturn V rocket that used to take American spacecraft to the moon. The station is more than twice as long as the Soviet Almaz, 24.5 meters with a diameter of 6.5 meters. It was a very wide, very wide station. 
Конечно, там мы решались и разведывательные задачи на Skylab. The living conditions on Skylab are luxurious by space standards. During exercise sessions, astronauts can jump from wall to wall. The station is equipped with showers, and each of the three crew members has a separate cabin. The last mission returned to Earth in February of 1974. Afterwards, the station remained empty. Only five years later, it would crash into the Pacific Ocean. Shortly before crashing, Soviet cosmonauts spot an already deserted American station. Они увидели эту станцию на расстоянии примерно порядка 70 километров. Что такое 70 километров? Они увидели станцию Скалы, конечно, без всяких очертаний. Это яркая, яркая такая крупная, как звезда. These observations are made by cosmonauts Pavel Popovich and Yuri Artuhin aboard the USSR Salut 3 Almaz orbital station. The crew's top secret mission was to last for many months. This little device, they would actually put the tubes of food, which had chicken or beef, just like regular food, but for space, specially made. They would close it, warm it up, take it out. Now, of course, there were two. There were no individual capsule rooms on the station. So the other cosmonaut slept right here. And what do you think is behind here? This used to be actually top secret. And I'm about to reveal it. What do you think this is? Ta-da! It's a toilet. It might not look like one, but if you bring this down, and this is how the cosmonauts used to go to the toilet. It's very cozy. <laughs> you can barely fit. Just like that. Ta-da! This used to be called fialka, which means violet in Russian. And everything would be stored in these uh, little vessels here. Yeah, quite tight. The cosmonauts don't stop working in orbit for even a minute. When one is working with surveillance instruments, the other is resting or exercising. Then they switch places. This right here is a little exercise machine that they had, a mini treadmill. And then the cosmonauts would literally simulate running. And that was to make sure that they maintained their walking skills, because of course, after spending days here, they would have some issues. Also, this would help them prevent a loss of uh, calcium in their muscles and also train their cardiovascular system. But the crew's main task is to observe American military sites on Earth with this unique observation device, which can magnify images up to 80 times. 80 крат это очень большое увеличение. Он может различить не не только там тип самолета, там тип корабля, там да, а даже понять автомобиль, там относится ли корабль, да, военный, гражданский, какие его задачи. This device makes the rotation of the Earth appear to slow down, so cosmonauts can get a good look at sites of interest. Станция летит со скоростью 8 километров в секунду. И для того, чтобы увидеть то, что он хочет, значит, с помощью этого объектива, была такая возможность, ну, условно говоря, остановить бег Земли, как бы, то есть остановить то изображение, которое он увидел на станции. Дальше он проводит описание этого объекта. The optical site makes it possible for the lens to focus on a specific stretch of the Earth's surface. As a result, when observing a military airfield, a cosmonaut has up to 50 seconds to count all the planes and take the clearest picture. This was the biggest eye of the Almaz, the Agat camera. Its lens had a diameter of almost two meters. There were also 14 long focus cameras on the station loaded with cassettes containing 500 meters of photographic film each. The most important images were immediately transmitted to Earth via a radio television channel. And then all the film was dropped to Earth in a special capsule. Надо сказать, что когда американцы об этом узнали, они тоже немножко заволновались. В принципе, в капсуле могла быть и не пленка, а, допустим, даже ядерный заряд, к примеру. Тем более, что станция летала постоянно круглосуточно на территории США. But the Americans don't know about the Almaz's other secret. The station is equipped with a cannon. 
This is the Sheets One or Shield One defense system, which had the Nudelman Richter or NR23 auto cannon, which you can see right here. It's normally stored under the glass, but today they've opened it for us and we can look at it in greater detail. This is the only weapon to have been fired in space that we know of, of course. This is the ammunition belt right here. It's really, really heavy. But what exactly was the weapon supposed to protect the Elmas from? Nineteen sixty nine. The Americans begin work on the space shuttle. Ominous rumors circulate in the USSR, speculating that the cargo hold of this new reusable spacecraft has been specifically designed to accommodate Soviet orbital stations, stations that would be stolen from orbit. Could the, uh, could the American space shuttle have hijacked uh, the, the uh, Soviet Elmaz uh, space station or uh, Salyut space station? There were no plans that I'm aware of to do that. Nevertheless, the Elmaz is armed with a cannon. The cannon is firmly attached to the lower part of the Elmaz. To aim it, the entire station must be turned around. The cannon has a range of three kilometers, with a firing rate up to 950 rounds per minute and a muzzle velocity of 650 meters per second. But that's in theory. In practice, Soviet engineers were afraid that the recoil from firing in an airless environment would knock the station out of orbit. That's why they decided to test the gun in autonomous mode when there were no cosmonauts aboard the station. In January of 1975, the cannon on the Almaz opened fire. These were the first shots in space. Telemetry is fixed, the gun Это практически это был первый в мире салют в космосе благодаря нашей стрельбе залповой с нашей пушки. It is only after these tests that the designers are reassured the recoil would not affect the station's trajectory because it was too heavy. Если есть отдача, есть механическое воздействие, есть оно. Но оно гасится тут же двигателями стабилизации и все. Only the first Almaz stations were equipped with rapid-fire cannons. Due to the lack of atmosphere, projectiles experience no resistance in space, so firing ranges increase. But this weapon is still intended for close combat. In order to hit American nuclear warheads or destroy enemy satellites at a distance, next-generation active defense systems were installed on Almaz. This is it, the Shield 2 space-to-space -space homing missile. It could hit targets at a distance of up to 100 kilometers. Its blunt nose had a radar that guided it towards its target. Each had 96 cartridges filled with solid fuel inside, placed like dandelion petals around the central combustion chamber. They were like small rockets. As it approached its target, the entire vehicle exploded and small hard shells scattered like shrapnel. In 1977, the U.S. begins work on a program dubbed ASAT to launch anti-satellite missiles similar to Soviet ones into orbit. First, an airplane lifted a rocket with an anti-satellite missile into the sky and then the rocket launched from under the plane's belly carried it into space. MH. IV, по-моему. На F-15 устанавливалась ракета с малогабаритным снарядом. This killer satellite was just 46 centimeters long, 30 centimeters in diameter, and weighed just 15 kilograms. It had engines and a guidance system, but no explosives on board. It was to destroy targets simply by hitting them at high speed. It took almost 10 years and $1.5 billion to develop a system incorporating three dozen aircraft. ASAT testing would not begin until the mid-1980s. September 15, 1985. F-15 pilot Major Doug Pearson fires a missile at a Solwind target satellite. It is believed that he knocked it out, becoming the first person in history to hit a satellite with a rocket. But did the shell actually hit the satellite, or did the target satellite explode on its own? Sputnik rasypался в мелкие брызги, так скажем, и часть этих брызг ушла на более высокий орбит. Это может быть только при брезантном взрыве внутри спутника. А в то время эти спутники 
все более-менее носили разведывательный характер, и в них всегда помещалась и у американцев, и у нас система аварийного подрыва объекта. Когда он исчерпал весь ресурс и не нужен, и чтобы никому не достался, его просто уничтожали. Поэтому вполне возможно, что это был спектакль. However, Soviet engineers have no time to speculate. They have their own problems to deal with. The Almaz space station seem to be inhabited by evil gremlins, and their crews repeatedly find themselves on the brink of death. On August 16, 1974, Gennady Serafanov and Lev Domin are to dock at a station, but the rendezvous system fails, and it's a miracle that they don't crash into the Almaz. The first crew members of the next Almaz would be Boris Molinov and Vitaly Zholobov. However, on the 42nd day of their flight, all the lights of the station suddenly went out. Раз и темно. В станции темно. И тишина. И это вот тишина космоса. Тишина. Абсолютная тишина. Ничего не работало. Да. И нет электричества вообще на станции. Ноль. Настолько это сильное впечатление производит на тебя. Тишина в космосе. <laughs> After an hour and 47 minutes, the cosmonauts manage to restore power, but then start feeling unwell. The flight has to be abruptly terminated. The next crew, Zudov and Rajdestvinsky, are unable to dock with the Almaz, and after plunging into Lake Tengiz in Kazakhstan, the cosmonauts almost suffocate in the re-entry capsule. Они в 12 ночи условно бухнулись в озеро Тенгиз и их вытащили из спасаемого аппарата только, по-моему, часов в 9 и в 10 утра. This was the last cosmonaut flight under the secret Almaz program. In 1978, the launches were halted. It is believed that the crews of the Salut stations, which were dual-use stations, could also conduct reconnaissance. So, by the second half of the 1970s, the USSR possesses an entire space flotilla. It has manned orbital stations, operational reconnaissance satellites, and interceptor satellites. This system was in 1979. On the 90th floor of Baikonur, until the 1993 year, it had a force of military force with the use of it. Even though Almaz creator Vladimir Chalamet's grand plans to build 50 orbital reconnaissance stations remains a dream, the USSR is still firmly ahead in the military space race. However, in the early 1980s, a new round of military confrontation in space begins. April 12, 1981, the 20th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight is also the day when the first American shuttlecraft, the Columbia, was launched. Zero, booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia. A new decade of spaceflight begins. From the tower and roll program initiated. The military in Moscow is alarmed by the fact that the new ship can carry a very heavy payload up to 30 tons. But what kind of cargo? A large fighter satellite? A nuclear bomb? The launch cost 20 million dollars. It should fly once a week. And we didn't understand how it is. 29 tons it is flying and it flies so often. So it turns out that it is 400-500 tons a year on orbit. What did they think about it? Moscow fears the shuttle is capable of launching a surprise strike against the USSR from an altitude of 80 kilometers. There is this rumor that uh, the uh, American space shuttle was originally a, uh, a strike platform, a bomber, um, but that's um, almost certainly not true. But as far as the space shuttle itself being used as a bomber, it, was, it would have been so impractical. But in the USSR, they believe they must stand up to the Americans. On June 14, 1982, a huge military exercise begins, spanning the whole of the USSR and Eastern Europe. Its participants practice a retaliatory strike against the United States. The exercise lasts until the end of September, but its fourth day frightens the Americans the most. So, 
Soviet fighter satellite launched under the name Cosmos 1379 approached and shot down the target, imitating an American navigation satellite. In the U.S., the events of that day are called the seven-hour nuclear war. Now it's the Americans' turn to respond. On March 23, 1983, President Reagan announces the so-called Strategic Defense Initiative. It will take years, probably decades, of effort on many fronts. By the end of the 20th century, the U.S. is planning to launch an armada of satellites into orbit armed with state-of-the-art weapons, including lasers. They are to shoot down Soviet missiles as well as orbital stations and satellites if necessary. But even in America, many considered this plan to be a bluff from the very start. The Energia Buran system is the Soviet answer to the U.S. is over for good. It was believed that the USSR was losing the Cold War. But in the field of military space technology, this was not the case. After all, America's Star Wars program was also beginning to wane after the collapse of the USSR, as it required a lot of money. In the end, the Americans never deployed their new weapons in space. And in many areas, for example, the creation of interceptor satellites or orbital stations, the USSR was significantly ahead by the time it collapsed. So in the multi-decade space race, the Stars and Stripes space program never managed to defeat the red one.